Once you enter these machines and the transfer is complete, you will have the skills necessary to crush the remnants of the Assassin Order, ending this war once and for all. Any questions? is a series that is developed in a peculiar manner. Where other franchises have refined its mechanics through a mixture of iteration and innovation, Assassin's Creed constantly swaps or repurposes its features, trying on the current trendy hat with each installment. Despite the shocking number of sequels and spin-offs, the combat and platforming remain almost too static and shallow to hold the franchise on its own merits. Instead, they are further trivialized when sequels introduce tools that simplify the moment-to-moment -moment decisions. As a result, the individual games are more often known for sections and game modes completely separate from the core formula. Assassin's Creed 2 was the sequel that started to flesh out the open world by adding an economy and several light RPG elements. While this feature has managed to persist throughout the series, it could be considered a crucial turning point, paving the way for Ubisoft's own brand of open world playgrounds that many franchises have taken note from. Revelations tried to cash in with the tower defense mode, but by severely reducing the player's actions it came off as lackluster and unengaging, which Ubisoft themselves seemed to realize because it was treated more as a punishment than a selling point. Assassin's Creed 3 featured the introduction of ship combat, which had enough weight and complexity to become a satisfying pastime in between core gameplay sections. It was then flashed out and became the primary method of transport in Black Flags, which became one of the most well-received games in the series. But what I want to talk about is the mode that seems to have been ignored by most discussions of the series, even ignored by Ubisoft themselves, as they have excluded it from the recent Ezio collection. It was a mode that tapped into a genre that even now has been barely explored and has never been tackled in a full-fledged game. I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, the Multiplayer Contracts mode. You may be surprised to hear of a multiplayer focusing solely on stealth or even that it was born from Assassin's Creed, a series that, while advertising a cloak and dagger profession, prefers to immerse itself in set pieces and explosions. But the alchemists at Ubisoft Montreal managed to craft something unique. There are only two other multiplayer games that I know of that revolve around stealth, Spy vs Spy from Splinter Cell, and Arkham Origins third person shooter and Cape Crusader hybrid. However, those games do not tackle stealth in the same manner that Assassin's Creed does. In fact, it shares more similarities to a Hitman game, where hiding in plain sight and setting up creative kills makes up the core of the game mode. A large part of its success was due to the sheer potential that player vs player engagements could provide in this format. One of the key elements of stealth games is how enemies and environments will react to your presence, whether a guard is unaware of the bloodthirsty rogue behind them, or if they've found evidence that they're not alone, should ideally affect how they behave and what actions they will take to find you. Unfortunately, it is difficult and time-consuming to program high-quality AI, and as a result, a lot of games have ended up producing some pretty brain-dead enemies. Now, consider if that guard was a player. All that tedious code and testing is significantly reduced, and with it comes an even larger array of interactions possible within that scenario. So a standard match starts with everyone choosing their own character as a template. Once the level is loaded, it is populated with several hundred NPCs that are modeled to look like a copy of each player's chosen template. Now that Venice has been populated by a surprising amount of jesters and whores, the players are let loose to latch onto the Italian architecture and irritate the citizens in the same manner you did in the single player. The objective of the match works in a similar manner to a game of cat and mouse. Every player in the match starts with someone else as the target, so everyone has a player to kill and a player that wants you killed. The goal is to gain the most points you can within a 10 minute match by killing your targets and avoiding your pursuers. Due to this setup, players will start gravitating towards each other until you'll find almost every assassin closing in on one spot, resulting in a not so friendly family reunion that the computer will dispassionately announce as a massacre. The aim of the game is to be as discreet as possible while amassing a steady stream of points throughout the match. While parkour is fully implemented into these maps, there are a lot of mechanics in place to discourage aggressive behavior. While you do receive 100 points for a kill, and various bonuses based off how and where you kill your target, your biggest and most common social points will be based off the detection bonus. Depending on how you act within your target's line of sight, you will either get a discreet bonus, a silent bonus, or an incognito bonus. Or, no bonus if you completely deplete the detection meter and initiate a chase. The meter is raised by simply doing nothing suspicious within your target's line of sight, and it is lowered by any high-profile action. 
you also just stick out like a sore thumb, because surprisingly none of the citizen scale buildings then perch themselves on rooftops. Cutting back to the chase phase, initiating one is the worst case scenario. It gives your target a chance to escape and earn points by avoiding capture. The map also includes chase breaker routes, designed to separate you from your target so that you're not spending the entire match playing a game of co-op. Even if you do manage to kill them, you get the bare minimum of 100 points and have likely revealed yourself to your pursuers. To help avoid this, there are hundreds of hiding places littered throughout the map. Buy in some hay, sit on a bench, talk shop with your mates, talk shop with the mates who find your Facebook posts a little too political. As a result, hiding is extremely beneficial and is never inconvenient. However, the point system does not only discourage aggressive play, but also extremely passive strategies. While you can earn points from stunning your pursuers or luring them into killing an NPC, you won't be earning points above 200. So you're going to have a hard time taking or holding the lead if you're only paying attention to your pursuers. Your biggest source of points will always be your targets, and while a high kill-death ratio isn't necessary to secure first place, a winning strategy always involves moving towards your next target. Finding these players will be tricky, as the game will rarely give you concrete information on its own. You have a compass that will give you the general direction of where your target is, but as you close in on them the compass will become less precise until it gives no direction at all, only lighting up when the target is within your line of sight and playing a heartbeat sound when you are within stabbing distance. The game will also warn you of nearby pursuers by playing whispers that can get louder the closer they are, as if they're praying for your safety as you pass on to the last place. While the line of sight indicator of the compass can be used for screening, and players are highlighted if they're recklessly moving in high profile within your line of sight, the game will almost never blatantly tell you which character is an NPC or player. On that note, it's unique to have a stealth game where staying out of sight has a little advantage. Players and NPCs of the same template are visually identical, so the game instead tests you on recognizing characteristics of the NPC's behavior and using them to pick up the players and the NPCs. Aside from the blatantly obvious actions players can do to stand out, there are areas of the map NPCs never enter. They usually won't jog unless it needs to catch up with the rest of the group, and the pathing will almost always be inefficient, never cutting corners or moving directly from A to B. Players are constantly pushed back to identically to appear, while also being pressured to maintain or take the lead, creating a mode where the short-term and long-term goals will often be opposed to each other, a dynamic that most games strive to attain to create a tense moment-to-moment -moment decision. It's also worth noting that strategies in play are not exclusive in what goal they benefit. Stunning pursuers or running away is pretty aggressive, but it helps you survive, and hiding near your target will net you a high-value kill. So while the core mechanics and systems have already established a stable foundation for the game, your toolset is expanded even further by a customizable loadout. You can have two abilities from a whole arsenal, as well as a perk, a killstreak bonus, and a deathstreak bonus. The perks apply a small tweak to your loadout, and the killstreaks apply either a point bonus or reset your cooldowns depending on whether you're on a roll or in need of a pick-me-up. But ultimately, these bonuses won't feel noticeable to most players. Now your abilities, on the other hand, are your main assets in matches. They are a variety of tools that help give you an edge in three main areas. Defensive abilities that help you hide from or stun players. Offensive abilities used to kill targets with various advantages and disadvantages or utility powers that assist in picking out players from the NPCs, or various other uses. Now while I have forced these abilities into some narrow definitions, they are versatile enough that they overlap into other categories with creative use. They also counter one another and can be dealt with on their own with some quick thinking. A pursuer with a high ground can safely jump on me without worry of a smoke bomb, but with throwing knives I can cripple their movements or even force them off the building. The biggest offset of your abilities is that they have severe cooldowns, the average being a full minute. As well as fitting to the slow and methodical pace of the game, these cooldowns frame the abilities as a highly valuable trump card and, as a result, ends up playing a large factor into encounters where players will plan engagements based on what they have in hand and what they believe the other player has equipped. Now in a standard match, it is probably good enough to maintain a good stream of incognito kills and stuns. However, as you start to play against more experienced players, it becomes important to maximize your point earnings, at which point you'll start aiming for variety bonuses. These are valuable goals that are earned by performing several different kills in a match. By attaining variety, greater variety, and extreme variety, you can earn up to 1200 additional points, which would make up a quarter of your final score, more or less. Therefore, you'll find that high-level matches do not devolve into several players playing safe, as players in the back will want to catch up as quickly as they can, and players in the lead will want to leave a greater divide behind them. Overall, the multiplayer emphasizes a balancing act between several elements at once on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. 
You're prioritizing between slow and fast playstyles. You're juggling multiple players to find or avoid. You're making educated bets on who is or isn't an NPC. You're questioning how exposed you are and if you've already been spotted. And you're constantly weighing the benefits of an ability against the cooldown where you'll be rendered defenseless. In this mode, you act calm and lay back in hiding, but that is only a disguise. Underneath is almost a state of panic, panning around information that isn't concrete, hoping for the opportunity to arrive before the whispers get louder. The tension is palpable. You aren't an action hero. You can't shrug off hundreds of bullets and stab wounds. But of course, neither can your target. Unfortunately, this was the peak of what the series could offer. While the future installments are still well made and kept the core dynamic of the matches intact, Brotherhood still felt like, at least to me, the game that best embodied the cat and mouse concept. Revelations added a feature of contested kills, where trying to stun a pursuer who is about to kill you will now award you points and cripples the pursuer's point gain. This meant that targets only needed to be aware of you or have quick reaction times to immediately hamper the player's potential point gain, and it influences a more aggressive playstyle that was originally heavily discouraged. In conjunction with the bombs from the single player, certain abilities can now also be thrown a few meters in front of you, as well as detonating them at your feet. This newfound range, along with a list of changes to abilities, puts the question of balance in an awkward position. Smoke Bomb in particular became a contentious topic. Regardless of whether or not it was overpowered, it did define a large amount of the meta surrounding the game. Also, due to a bloated number of bonuses added throughout the series, and no changes to the requirements, the effort it takes to attain extreme variety is trivialized by redundant bonuses. Now, to be fair, these sequels did come with the occasional improvement, and added new and interesting modes such as Deathmatch, where small maps make for hectic matches, Domination, a King of a Hill type mode where targets and pursuers constantly fluctuate between roles, and Wolfpack, a brief but fun co-op mode against the AI. But once I was satisfied by 3, I lost most of my interest in the game mode. This is why I can't really comment on Black Flag's multiplayer and whether it could be considered an improvement. When Unity was announced, it came with the shocking news that it won't feature the ship combat nor the multiplayer that garnered Ubisoft a large amount of praise. It was scrapped in favour of an online co-op feature which never really caught on, likely due to Unity's poor reputation as a buggy train wreck on launch. And now, Syndicate just doesn't bring anything substantial to the table. Instead of switching to a new hat or reusing an old one, it just wears a plain old top hat with a few minor gadgets inside. In the end, it doesn't seem like Ubisoft sees any more potential in the multiplayer, and are now preparing for the next set of gimmicks that may make or break the game. And that was Assassin's Creed's multiplayer, a genuine surprise that hasn't been copied since. While there are other games that fit into this genre, this mode tackles stealth in a completely different way. I hope in this break of mainline releases, Ubisoft reconsiders it and brings it back in the next installment. Would be even better to have a back to basics version of Brotherhood, but with the new modes and customization options included. But for now, I'm just gonna lay back, grab a pint, and enjoy this beautiful sunny.